Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pedro Balaj. I'm a currently lead data scientist at Farfetch. Farfetch is uh, online e-commerce of fashion. Uh, we have offices in Portugal, we have offices in London, and we have offices worldwide. Uh, today, I'm not going to talk about Farfetch. I'm going to talk about how can uh, you drive your search teams into the future using data-driven methods. So, to start the topic, I will put a question here, and I. I'm going to ask you that. Uh, what do you think about relevant search? So some of you may not know search well, or may not know what means relevant search in the context of e-commerce search. So input some words, and i explain later. So, relevant search is the ability to you to retrieve relevant results, meaningful results. You don't want to retrieve results that are uh, not good to the user, given the query, or results that, or you, you, you don't want to miss out results that could be retrieved and the user could click and buy your product, for example. And uh, the question that I put is because relevant search as of today, it's kind of art because it's a very complex and difficult thing. So, but before entering in relevant search, entering the search problem, let's start from. Uh, ah, and by the way, this presentation is going to have some pieces of art. Uh, let's start from the beginning uh, this, of uh, how search teams are created and, and how relevant search comes uh, into play. So in the start, when a company decides to implement some search mechanism, for example, designing by have a search interface to the user, it usually uh, does not call specialists that sit together in the table and uh, have a very long run plan about how your search will be developed. Usually you call someone who is his CV has like Elasticsearch or Solaire or something like that and ask, okay, could you please implement a search engine for us? And that technician guy implement a search engine. That, that works pretty well. It's very simple, straightforward to implement uh, uh, out-of-the-box solution nowadays. Uh, so initially, you focus on very technical aspects. You put that search engine to work, but later when you run your business, you start to figure out that some of your results are not relevant, or you are not retrieving, uh, given the queries, you're not retrieving results that a user may like, or you're retrieving a lot of results that the user is really not looking for. So uh, later, it comes the attention to the search quality. And uh, we have a problem here. Uh, the company starts to having a lot of pain problems or pain points. Uh, first, the lack of planning ahead. So remember that you just put in place a search engine, but you didn't figure out what demands of expertise for your engineering team or for your search team in order to run this search engine. So uh, it kind of restricts the growth of your company. And you know that any company nowadays needs to grow, needs to be ahead of its competitors. Uh, also, you, and uh, uh, probably that's the case, you have a very good team of engineers that understands the technical aspects of your, relev of your search engine, but they lack some expertise in search quality. So usually you ask that guy that's uh, usually a programmer or a DevOps, to implement some relevant search measurement. So to look for synonyms, to look for uh, related words, to tweak boosts, and that guy like, oh, I like to program. I don't like to look for results. I don't like to really checking uh, search quality. And uh, uh, that complexity of uh, imposing relevant search tasks to the team, it just grows over time. So it gets more and more complex. Let's check why. So and just before, I just give you some initial thoughts about relevant search. Uh, relevant search is a very difficult thing to state what it is. So it's better to say what you should not have, and then you can understand what relevant search is important. So in your search engine, what, what are the things that should not happen? You should not retrieving, you are also, uh, what should not happen? You are retrieving items that are not relevant. So you put a query, you have the products, and that product is really doesn't what you want to, to, to buy uh, to your e-commerce. Or you're missing items that are relevant. So some of products are maybe described with other words, and then your query is just returning uh, that specific words that the user query for. And then, therefore, you don't have these products in your search results. Or uh, you are showing the items, but the top, topest items are not the relevant ones. 
and then you have a problem of ra ranking here. Some steps to relevant search. There is very famous books uh, available uh, for relevant search, for tweaking uh, Elasticsearch, Solaire, in terms of relevance. And most of them are more technical. But uh, in a matter of uh, points that a relevance engineer or uh, someone in your company that may address relevance can work, it's uh, you can tweak the relevance score, the way that you score your products against the queries that the users are doing. For example, you can use TF, ADF, that's a common metric in inf information retrieval, or uh, uh, BM25, that's the current metric of relevance. That's, it's a variation of TFDF that's implemented for Elasticsearch, for example. You can use mood field matching, so you're not just looking for your product name, but for your product description or for some category or attributes of your product. And then, as you're looking for different fields, you may need to require to boosting. So I want that a match in the name of the product more re should be more, more relevant than a match in the description that should be more relevant than maybe a match in some attributes. So you, you need to boost uh, distinctly each field. And then you need to, to go to match, or say how you match two strings. So you could use a phrase matching, matching the whole string, you could use query matching, so the terms in your query could be match isolated, and then you can consider if you're gonna use a composition function of both, and you can use, for example, fuzzy matching, that you're gonna matching terms that could contain one letter uh, changed, for example, or could have some fuzziness to, to the original term. Uh, some text normalizations uh, could also happen in place. For example, steaming or uh, dealing with plurals or, for example, gender variations of the words are something that we usually do in search engines. You may require two synonyms taxonomies and ontologies that are somehow ways to include uh, more knowledge to your retrieval and at the end you can uh, you can resource to rules and exceptions so this is more or less a guide for someone that's working relevant search we try from the top and then we're trying to do things that are more or less common to all your keywords and at the end if nothing works you just put an exception the problem of putting rules and exceptions and to, resource, to use resource like synonyms, taxonomies, is how to keep them, all right? And my question to you is how easy is to maintain the control over all these parameters? So if you are a relevance engineer, if you're taking care of the relevance search of your e-commerce search, uh, how do you keep track of all the chains? How you maintain control? This is something very complex, all right? It's a complex task because there is a lot of nuts uh, and knobs and uh, uh, buttons that you need to press in order to configure your Elasticsearch, for example, uh, search engine in your Solar. Uh, and uh, not usually, uh, they are independent. Let's say that if you uh, change the boosts, you may also need to change, for, the, for example, the synonyms. If you change the synonyms, you, you need also to review some rules and then they are very dependent task. So that's why they are complex. And at the same time, I will ask for you uh, that work in a company that uh, is targeting for the future, is looking for growing, is looking for opening new markets. How do you expect to work in such environment that you need a complex team, that you need to develop complex tasks in order to do very basic, not basic thing, but a very straightforward thing that is relevant search. So uh, we are in an area of disruptive digital innovation. We really want to be ahead of competitors. We really want to deliver excellence. What happens, for example, if you have new products? If you receive, for example, a batch of, a, uh, you duplicate your catalog, for example, all the parameters, all the knobs that you already finely tuned in your search engine needs to be changed again. Or you open to new markets or you have, for example, new categories. What happens if you want to pursue internationalization of your business, if you want to go to China or go to Russia or go to uh, Arabic countries? How are you going to deal with those languages? Do you need to require to hire more relevance engineers, to hire more people? How are you going to scale in this age? One thing for sure is that you require fast uh, adaptation. 
And uh, if you don't have fast adaptation, uh, you are not going to last too much in the business. Uh, so my questions to you. First question is, uh, relevant searches are kind of hard, and I agree with, you with that. And the another question is, can relevant search be more science? And then now, I'm going to take more towards my bias, <laughs> and I can ask you if that could be a data science, because I'm from data science background. So if you analyze just what kind of data, because data science is based on the collection, processing, and automatizing tools based on data, what kind of data do we have? And we have a lot of data. For example, we have search logs. We know what the users are searching in our website. We have click-through logs, what the user are clicking. We have navigation logs. We understand how the user is navigating between pages. What's the user track? Uh, we have user preferences. If the user is uh, prefer or have some preference for one specific category or bought some specific products, uh, we can also resource, uh, res go to A-B testing if you want to collect more data specific to uh, some hypothesis that we want to verify. And you can, go, you can go to external resources. So, for example, you can look for your competitors or you can download some databases that are available online in order to improve your, uh, your search engine. So, the lesson here is that we have a lot of data and a lot of unexplored data. How to explore this data? So data science uh, contains both statistical methods to explore data and also some machine learning methods to automate the exploration, automate uh, some classification, some uh, decision function based on the data. And the lesson that I want to bring here is that machine learning is not uh, 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 a very difficult thing. No matter of fact, it's very easy. Okay? If you look for, and it is, <laughs> uh, machine learning is just a mathematical function, and let's remember Euler and the definition of mathematical function, that you receive some parameter, in the case, a data, all right, and you're trying to model that using some parameters, that it's not the case for us to discuss right now, but it's just trying to mimic some behavior and then to produce an output, okay, the output of that function. So you have an input data, you model that function to a training algorithm that is gonna be your machine learning algorithm and then you have a prediction. The difference between your prediction and your true data is what your training algorithm is going to look, is going to look for the patterns, is going to input these patterns in your function, and you're going to work with that. So in one effect, it's just a mathematical function. It's very simple. So how can I use, so if uh, machine learning is a mathematical function, how can I use machine learning uh, to build better search engines? The traditional approach, and the approach that I'm going to pursue uh, in the, the, the second part of this talk, uh, is this one. So you usually have different modules. In these different modules, you could have, for example, solutions in place that could be uh, provided for your search engine, or solutions that you could uh, have a machine learning module in place. You could have an autocomplete module. Your autocomplete is going to give you complete or suggestions is going to give you hints to your user in order to uh, search for a mer uh, more specific term. You're going you, to have a query understanding, where you're going to understand your query and what are the parts of your query and what the, what the user intention. You're going to have a query expansion, where you're going to take this uh, query understanding and try to go to your database and retrieve, retrieve items that are relevant to that your original understanding. You're going to try to rescore these items that you retrieve, for example, products, you are ranking then, and you're going to have your final products. That's more or less uh, a traditional architecture of search. Of course, in order to provide data to all these modules or all these mathematical functions, machine learning components, you have your click logs and all the data that uh, you have in your e commerce. Uh, but when I said that we are going to use data, when we are going to use machine learning, you also come up in your mind, okay, that guy is going to talk about deep learning. All right? Or that guy is going to talk about some very weird thing that's going to come queries, products, you're going to embed the thing to the same space and predict. And a matter of fact, this is the modern approach. There is some talks in the past, um, here, uh, I guess, at Berlin Buzzwords as well, to how to do product search using full end-to-end -end deep learning approaches. Okay, so one thing that you could do is you have your queries, 
you can have an encoding layer to encode the text in your queries in some numerical vector space. So you have a numerical representation of your queries, you have your products, you can have, for example, your product name, your product descriptions, your product attributes, and your product image, and embed everything into an encoding layer, into, again, into a numerical representation of your product, and you can use a mathematical function, a model, a machine learning model, that's going to map these two representations. This modeling is going to use the click logs to understand which queries lead to each product, and it's going to build a representation for a retrieval model. The, the modern, modern approaches are amazing. They are, uh, in a scientific perspective, they are the most beautiful thing I ever saw in uh, information retrieval. Uh, but they didn't work so well. Uh, it's not the, it's not the fact, so it's not the fact that they didn't work. They work. Uh, uh, myself and my company, uh, with my team, we tested some deep learning end-to-end -end approach. Uh, they work pretty well, but they have some issues, some issues that we need to deal, for example, bias uh, in the data, uh, the distribution of the data. You have more products that are popular than the products that are not popular, and how do you deal with unpopular products or products that do not have data to model your, your, your algorithms? Uh, how do you tweak, for example, uh, your learning functions, or how do you deal with your loss functions? So there is a lot of challenges uh, ahead, and I think that's why we are not still using that. But I bet that in the future we're going to see more and more these full automated end-to-end -end approach. But here today I'm going to talk about more, more traditional architectures. Why? Because these architectures are very solid. We know, I know companies that uh, are using this architecture, so it's tested, industry tested. Uh, and this architecture is very easy to be interpreted. So if your if your relevant search, if your query is not working, you can open the components and understand why. Okay, and then you can support uh, quickly support business needs. If some uh, someone or some your boss knock your door and ask, "I want that done in two hours," you, you're gonna be not gonna be able to open the machine learning, uh, the neural network, uh, full end-to-end -end approach uh, in order to tweak that. But here you can add one rule add one exception. It's much easier to, to work with. So in this talk, this is the second part, I'm going to, I hope I, uh, I convinced you that it's necessary to have a better approach to relevant search that's not as complex as to have someone to look for all that complexity, that is to work with synonyms, to work with rules, to work uh, with uh, parameters in your search engine. And then I'm going to show you what's the path to a data-driven search engine. So remember the architecture that I spoke to you about. We're going to start talking about autocomplete suggestions. Why this is component is, most, is, is one of the most component, well, important components for your company? Because it's here that you drive your users to what he's looking for. Most of the users start searching, but they don't have a quite idea about what you're looking for, especially if you are in a very specific domain, for example, fashion, and the user is not a specialist of that domain. So the user does not know the terms of that domain to search for. And then, in autocomplete, you can help or support the user in the exploration of your products. Uh, there is a lot of alternatives. So the most simple one, you can implement that in a SQL database. It's a field-based autocomplete, so you just do that and select a uh, field, uh, like, and you put like, a, 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 you just select thing uh, in your field, uh, uh, all the words that started with that prefix. It's a very simple thing. Most of the companies are doing that. Uh, what's, uh, what's not so good, because it's uh, very dumb, uh, you could also uh, go to more sophisticated methods. For example, a phrase database autocomplete. What does it mean? It means that you go to your search logs, you go to your click logs, and understand what the user is searching for. And then you score the items that the user is searching. But how do you do that? For example, you have a vocabulary, things that the user usually type. Let's say that you have 2,000 words. And then you build a phrase database of the combination of all these words. And then with this phrase database, you can have, for example, a score this based on your training data, based on your search use, use and then offer to the user uh, in the autocomplete function. Okay? One thing that's important, this, uh, of course, you, you should prune uh, this database because, for example, uh, if you have 2,000 items and you have just three words, 
is 2,000 in a combination of three times. It's eight billion times. So we don't have a database to keep that. And it's just three words. So we need to have some pruning mechanism for that. One more wise way to do autocomplete, it's called language modeling. Language modeling, just to simplify you, is what Google uh, does when you go to Google search and it understands you it's the language modeling place. So uh, you could use a more probabilistic approach using hidden Markov models. So you are uh, modeling the probabilistic jump from one word to other word or from one character to other character, all right, using hidden Markov models, or you could go to neural language modeling. The neural language modeling is the actual state of the art for this kind of task. So this is the one I'm gonna uh, exemplify by then. And just to, uh, to tell you that's very learn, very easy to learn such model. You have a query, you have your autocomplete model, your autocomplete is learning for click logs, and here you self-contain some learned model that's gonna provide you the autocomplete function. So language modeling. Uh, the standard language modeling consists of recurrent neural networks that are these building blocks here, and some embedded space for the tokens. Could it be the words? or the characters. You embed that to space, that's very good for modeling because you don't have the restriction of how many words do you have. You just embed that to space. And because it's a recurrent, so it's the same cell that's recurring time over time, you are unbounded by the sentence length. So you could have sentences, you could have uh, queries of all sizes. So you're gonna suggest, for example, the 10th uh, uh, or the length uh, or how many uh, words we, would you require. And at the end, you have, uh, modeling that with data, you have the probability of seeing uh, a phrase, seeing some set of words to predict the next word. Uh, so there is some vector representation of words exist in the literature. Uh, you're gonna find word vec is a very popular one. You also have a query vec. There is the reference here, and the slides are already available if you want to download. Uh, uh, it's good because you have unbounded vocabulary and sentence sizes, and it's very important because you can extend that language model for a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, and for example, uh, to adapt to deal with spellings. The user are doing right, but it's missed some character. Your autocomplete is not gonna work anymore. In this case, it's gonna work because it's gonna be uh, permissive to spelling errors, and you could also have different words. So start looking for uh, some word, and you have synonyms of that word, you could uh, not just autocomplete, but out-suggest to the user, all right? So there is uh, a lot of different words in this direction. Uh, quite understanding. So the second step after, or the, this is the first step, autocomplete is a step uh, self-contained. So the query understanding is the first step towards the, the total search relevance. Uh, you could have different approaches again. You could percolate your query. There is a function in the major search engines that you could percolate queries and use that percolated results to understand or to match individual words against uh, uh, fields in your database. Okay, That's, there is a lot of documentation about that. Or you could use some naming inch recognition system. The name it recognition system is the most uh, advanced in user approach, where you're gonna look for your sequence of words and understand when each word belongs or not to a category, to a brand, or to a size, or to a product name, or to a product uh, attribute, all right? So you're gonna find name entities, these entities uh, in your queries. There is the conditional run of fields that's uh, very standard and old approach, and there's again the neural name inch recognition system that's the current state of the art. So, the neural name inch recognition system it's very similar to the language model. We have again the embedding layer where you're going to embed each word that's a lexical representation into a numeric space, and that's the trick of the neural approach. You need to embed that numeric space, and that numeric space could, for example, model some similarity among words. In the case of word vec for example, when you use that embeddings, you're going to have a LSTM layer. In the case, that case, it's a bidirectional because it goes to both sides. A LSTM, it's a, spec it's, uh, it's a unit that's uh, some specification of the recurrent neural network. It's still a recurrent neural network, but with some pluses, let's say. Uh, it's the most uh, traditional approach to use LSTMs for 
for this kind of task. Then uh, you project for each word uh, some projection of your state from the Lex TM to a final state where you're going to do some global, uh, some global normalization using uh, Viterbi algorithm that you're going to provide the output for each word, the label that each word has. For example, if I have the first word that's a category, it's going to say it's a category. The second word may be an attribute, it's an attribute. The third word may be starting, for example, a brand. It's going to say this word is starting a brand. The second word is going to be uh, the continuation of that brand, and, and so on. Okay. Why to use neural image recognition? State of the art. It's, it's really uh, one of the best. It's not just a little bit more complicated. It's, in a matter of fact, it's simpler than uh, CRF. The models are very easy. You could, that, you, you could do that in Python with uh, six or seven lines of code using standard frameworks for deep learning. It's very easy to do that. Uh, it could deal with some word variations when you use some character embeddings uh, uh, for that and misspellings. Uh, usually requires uh, what's a con here, but it's something that uh, we are used to in machine learning. You require data to train, so it may require some human annotators to lab label you some data with entities. There is also some companies that could provide that, and there is a set of uh, open source libraries available. I know that Salando, for example, uh, a very uh, interesting and good company, uh, open source the Flare. That's a framework to do name image recognition. It's among uh, the state of the art uh, of tools for that, and it's very simple to use. Okay, second component, and uh, in my opinion, the most important one query expansion. Okay, I understood the query, so I have the annotated the query stating which is a category, which is a design, which is the term that I don't know. Uh, what can I do in terms of search with that? That query expansion module is going to tell me uh, what I should do. For example, I could go to a faceted search when, for example, if the user just put a word that for me means a category, I just want to apply the category filter on a website and retrieve all the results from that category. I don't really need to go to, to retrieving uh, uh, a lot of items, I just apply facets here. I could go to different paths. So imagine here in the query expansion model that you have at your disposition, disposition a se uh, 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 several additional knowledges. Okay? Uh, and then for each additional knowledge, you don't know too much if that's going to help or not. So you're going to take different paths. You're going to, in Q1, try, for example, the facets. In Q2, try synonyms or maybe expand similar words. In Q3, Taxonomies, ontologies, knowledge graphs. You can have, for example, taxonomies in one, ontologies in another, so it's not bounded to four. Okay, just for simplification, you can have as many uh, as you wish. Of course, there is here uh, some, some engineering uh, uh, concern, but uh, let's say that you can have as many uh, different components as you want. And you can also have some graph-based techniques. I will ex exemplify this last one that's a very interesting one to extract from data. Uh, if we look for our click logs, what are you going to find? We are going to find, in one side, queries, in another side, items that we retrieve, usually products for e-commerce. Okay? And you're going to see that such one query lead to a click in one product, in another and another. Or the query lead to click to other products. What kind of information, and that's my question for you, can I retrieve from that? That's a lot of things to work with. So there is a lot of information that's latent to this representation. One example, I could look for all the queries that are related. If one query led to the same products, exactly the same products as the other query, the two queries are similar. Okay? If the intersection of the products that two queries led to are like 80-90%, I could say that they are 80-90% similar. Okay, you could retrieve that. The same thing in the product side. I could look for the product side and uh, see which products are similar. So they should be clustered together. And if you look at some products that are very similar and one query is, not, is retrieving this product but not the other, I could, for example, tell my search engine to retrieve the other product and send that additional information. Uh, you could also do some transferring. So I understand that query B 
contains some terms, some words, and then I'm going to transfer uh, these attributes to the other products that the query B is related to. Okay, these products, they contain attributes as well. I was gonna, I, and then I'm going to transfer back these attributes, and I'm going to jump in from one side to the other side, transferring this knowledge, and then the end, I'm going to converge in the same vector space of representation of both sides. Okay, that's the idea, for example, of vector propagation. And there is the paper here. It's a very interesting work. Uh, we already work with vector with uh, this kind of techniques, and they are they are very good. We could also go further. Graph embedding is uh, is one of the most recent techniques, 2018. Uh, that also does the same. Uh, it's more specific graphic embeddings to recommendation systems, but it works perf perfectly uh, in such results. And then you can use all these informations to to improve your uh, search queries. Uh, of course, I got a lot of results. And then I got results from Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. I have, for some results, I have the same products. For others, I have distinct products. How am I going to rescore that bunch of scores? Okay, because I have different paths. And each path, I may trust a little bit more, a little bit less. For that, I'm going to use a parameterized model or parameterized function. This is very used to the literature. Uh, for example, the Google engine uses that. Okay, this is a very simple function. Here I'm going just to interpolate all the scores for each product, all the scores that I received in these lanes, let's say, by some uh, lambda factor. So lambda one is a scalar, it's a numeric value that's gonna tell the importance of the Q1. Lambda two is all the numeric value that's gonna tell the importance of Q2 and so on. I could also have a very more detailed machine learning model, but I'm just going to attain to the simplicity of this concept here. And then I may use some click logs to learn. So I have, for example, uh, here I receive a product, here I didn't, he, or no, uh, here I received one score, here another, here another. Uh, and this product was clicked, so I'm going to reinforce that this score are right. Uh, if the products are not clicked, for example, or uh, are missed, uh, we can tell also to, to the learning mechanism that uh, uh, it should not be enforced, for example. You could use some learning uh, in this direction. Of course, after I have a lot of products and I have a lot of products rescored, uh, remember that I expanded my knowledge, so I'm retrieving more products than necessary. So instead of retrieving just like 100, I'm retrieving 1,000 but I don't want to display to user the 1,000 products. I want to find that the point, and, I, uh, uh, and then here I assume that they are ranked by relevance, I want to find the point where the products are not relevant to the query anymore. And then I'm going to start from top to down and find a point where I'm going to cut that. So for example, in Elastic, you have uh, some threshold cuts that you could impose to your search and say, after that relevant score, I mean, don't want more items. Okay, that's static. You could use a more dynamic approach, for example, using the standard deviation of your results. It's better. Or you could also use machine learning to determine that. So use machine learning based on click logs. Of course, you're going to need to start with a more permissive approach. You're going to need to show to the users more items, so the user may click or not click, and then you're going to learn a function in order to understand where is the best point to cut. So far, so good? Perfect. So, uh, the last one is about ranking. Uh, I'm not going to pay so much attention about ranking, because the ranking, uh, there is a lot of algorithms, the algorithms themselves, they have a lot of different mathematical concepts, but here I just want to mention you that I already have my relevance results. So my relevance search ends here. Okay, I already have the set of results that are relevant. But for some aspects, I want to re-rank them. I, s I know that they are relevant, but I want to re-rank, for example, to improve my, gr my profitability of my business. Right, so I want to put the products that has more margin, uh, of uh, uh, gain uh, first. Or, for example, I have some business decisions. I want to boost the sales off for some brand or for some partner, all right? So for that, the ranking, it's a module itself. 
And then in the ranking capability, I have different ranking algorithms. They are pretty standard. Uh, some of them are already implemented in the most recent uh, search engines or the most standard search engines, and you can uh, work with them. Okay, but at the end, just to, uh, to conclude my line of thought, showing all these components, I could say, all these components, they are machine learning. And then I said to you that all machine learning is a function. So if I have, for all the components, machine learning, I have a set of functions, one after the other. If I now work in that way, a set of the following functions, it's, so every component of search architecture is a function. A composition of functions is also a function. So every, all that architecture is here, is a single function. Of course, you could componentize that. You could work with different components. But what I'm explaining to you is that as, as I'm inputting data from my logs and then extracting some predictive models, I could work that as a single function. I could work with that as I have just one function that will tell me relevance. And I don't want to look for synonyms. I don't want to look for uh, uh, nuts and, knob, uh, and knobs and buttons that I need to push in this search engine anymore. So it's much more simpler. More. Uh, as it's a function, I could uh, condition that function to particular interests. So for example, I'm taking my data, and I might here, uh, you understand that I'm taking the whole data, but if I want to have a specific view for a user segment, so I know that some specific users, the VIP users, for example, they bought more of this product, or uh, some users are more training to buy uh, some other specific product, or I'm pushing some marketing campaigns, or I want to deal with regionality issues, for example, the users in the same country from one place are different from the users from the other place. I could segment those data, this data, all right, so I have a conditional data, I have a data segmented for that particular interest that I have. I'm going to train the same learning, relevant search learning function, and I'm going to have another function here, the G. This is a distinct function, I could apply that. For some cases, I don't have enough data, or my function is not strong enough, uh, this new function G. Uh, what I could do is to use multiple models. So. I could use a composition function between f, that was my first function, and g, that's more my conditional function, all right? Uh, and I can use a composition of both. So I'm going to get, get score of f, get score of g, and try to composition these functions by some parameterized learning. And then I'm going to have a final value. Okay. Wrap up. Wrap up. Uh, the lessons that I want to send to you, to tell you, is that uh, companies that have, has, have a significant value of search should focus more on data-driven search methods as a way of scaling open new markets. You only can survive in uh, some disruptive innovation scenario, uh, working with state-of-the-art, working uh, in new technologies that's going to allow you to grow, is going to allow you to scale. And then I believe, it's on my personal belief, that data-driven methods are the path to that. Data scientists are important. Uh, the provide data-driven approaches to your search. More than that, they are not just uh, why data scientists, why not machine learning engineers, what not research scientists. Because in my opinion, data scientists are the ones who can look for your data, who can clean your data, because there is a lot of uh, uh, workload to clean your data, to prepare your data, to train your machine learning models. That's, uh, I believe that's not the case to under fully understand the machine learning models or to develop new machine learning models because they already exist. You just need to understand what there is and work with that. Okay? And then they need to understand the results and they need to link with the business. They need to understand the business requirement. Here, I don't want to implement a fuzz, uh, uh, some complex and fancy framework. I want to deliver results to the business. And that's why I think data scientists are good on that. Relevance engineers, they are still important. I don't want to send you the message that we don't, don't need them. We need, we need. But I think the relevance engineers should focus more on, on search quality, measure search quality, tell us that we are doing right or wrong. And of course, if there is some quickly demand of the business, please change that, please make that search work. They are there for that, okay? They could provide some adjustments very quickly. 
So remember in the beginning of the talk, just to close, uh, uh, I mentioned to you that relevant search may be an art or maybe a science, and in my opinion, it's both. Okay. And the message that I want to send you is that data-driven methods are the future of relevant search. And uh, it, just for context, this paint, it's a portrait of Edmond Bellamy, was generated by adversarial network, neural networks, it's a machine learning component, and it was sold in 2018 by over 400,000. Okay, so the future is here. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions in the room? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned there's two methods, the traditional search and uh, the new method, or the, the new search, uh, and the new search doesn't work in most of the cases, or some of the cases. Have you thought about merging the two methods and using them together in the same system? That's our next experiment, yeah. Okay. Uh, in a matter of fact, this parameterized model uh, that I showed to you, that's what we're going to do. Let me go that. So, a uh, we have carry here writes here, but as a matter of fact, I have a scoring functions of a query given a product. All right, so I have a product and a query, I have a scoring function. I could use this modern approach, so a deep neural network to provide me a score, and I could learn some lambda value that could trust or not trust, depending on uh, if it's a top query, if it's uh, some query that I could not answer another way. Uh, so yeah. Basically, you, you could still use in these approaches, but um, my personal belief that it's uh, it should be included this uh, this architecture. More questions? So you have uh, added first annotation and afterwards expansion, which uh, but the expansion is mostly string based. So is there any reasoning for doing it in that or is that order, not the other order around? So. Your question is about the so uh, this. No, which one? Sorry, two, two more. Yes, this one. So here you have annotated query, and then afterwards you do the expansion. But you could also do it the other way around because your uh, the annotation may heavily depend on the expansion. Perfect. Yes, uh, uh, the query expansion sometimes uh, it's mixed and it, it's not wrong and right uh, with the retrieval part. So if you, want, if you tell me that your query expansion is when you go to retrieve the engine and retrieve the results, you're right. But in that case specific point, this is a machine learning module that's going to tell me what kind of different uh, knowledge I'm going to try to find the annotated query to generate multiple queries. And that multiple queries are going to change, to, are going to be sent to the search engine this step. So here I'm just going doing query rephrasing or query, uh, uh, query rewrite. That's the way I see. More questions? Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, in the first effort to build an end-to-end -end model, um, in that case, was the model similar to uh, the combination of the later existing models? And in that case, were you using auxiliary loss functions throughout to sort of... Uh, uh, maintain a sort of sensible um, output of each. Yeah, we did some experiments using triple loss function. We did also some experiments using other loss functions. And uh, the problem uh, that we found in our case of our very specific scenario, very specific data set, is conversions. So we trained a lot and the results were not converging. We tried to use other losses, we tried to use composite losses, and uh, it did not learn as well. Uh, because uh, we, we are a company, and we don't have unlimited time to explore the problem, let's say, that what I would love to have. Uh, we needed to just stop by three or four months of exploration with that initial results that we documented, and then we expected in the future to have a better understanding of uh, this deep neural networks approach and to continue that project from that standpoint. Okay, but yeah, there is a very different ways to approach that, and I could, I could offline go in details about what we did. Okay, yeah. Uh, in your talk, you didn't mention anything about um, like how will you evaluate the relevance? Like, did, in your experience, were using IR matrix like uh, precision at rate K, mean average precision, were they helpful or you always measured relevance by A-B testing? 
Uh, mm-hmm. Like uh, there was no, uh, no part about evaluation. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I should have included uh, evaluation here. It's a very important thing because as you're dealing with machine learning components, you need to evaluate in order to understand how close you are of the best solution. Uh, and but for evaluation, just to give you uh, uh, some big picture, uh, we usually evaluate in any DCG. And then you can do precision at 10, precision at 20, but it depends so much of your business. Because I could have, of course, I need to have a labeled data set. Uh, it's very important, but that labeled data set as human labeled, it's, it will not be your whole data set. It will be static over time. So you have some difficulties of that. You could do A B experimentation, we already do that. Uh, AB experimentation is a good source to understand where your methods are improved or not. But uh, your evaluation is important to train your methods. So we use basically some standard data set where a human, uh, we don't use, but uh, the message that I want to send is that uh, the way to do that is that we need to have a standard data set with a human, la- human rater uh, checking for a query, a list of results, which results are more relevant than others, and uh, labeling that, labeling that. Okay. Yeah, we, can, we can discuss that offline. We're five, like a little bit over time, and there's a coffee break now. So I suggest that anyone who wants to ask more questions stays in the room, and the other ones go for coffee. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Thanks.